Welcome back, guys, to another exciting episode of RX Muscle Spotlight. Today, we're going to be talking with Justin Leonard, who owns Workouts.com. He sells exercise equipment. He was a great team bodybuilder back in the 90s. And I got him here today because I want to talk about how to make money in bodybuilding. A lot of, you know, a lot of guys are not going to earn prize money. They're not going to win the Mr. Olympia contest, but they love to work out. They love the bodybuilding lifestyle. And Justin's going to give us some ideas about how you could increase your business, whether it be selling exercise equipment, nutritional supplements, your coaching, and how to utilize, you know, methods like Amazon.com, your own website and social media to earn a living doing what you like. Well, Justin, welcome to the show. Glad to be here with you today, sir. Thank you. And you know, you know we'll put up a few pictures uh, from uh, your uh, old website of you competing, but you were training out there in Alexandria, Virginia, which is the hometown of uh, Don Long. Uh, you trained back in the day with um, all those big names down that area. Now, was Lavroni ever at that gym or he was more in Maryland, I guess? I never saw him there, but yeah. I know he was in the area for sure. <laughs> How did you get always? Into yeah. He was a guest poster at almost every show. Yeah, yeah, down at. in your area for sure. <laughs> how, how did you actually even get involved with the whole bodybuilding world? Who did you meet? Who kind of you know introduced you to it? So the story is interesting. I actually started as a wrestler, okay. and then through the weight training component of wrestling, yeah, uh, did I become interested in bodybuilding? So at fourteen, so I'm a freshman in high school they were going around with a flyer on an all city team bodybuilding competition, uh, which was held in Anchorage, Alaska. Oh my and it God. would pit. Yeah. Uh, cause I was a military brat. So my dad ah, was actually in okay. the air force. So that's the you. connection. But, uh, this would pit the, uh, team bodybuilders from all the high schools in the region, uh, right. against each other to see who was the best. And long story short, I ended up winning, my uh, weight division in that show. So that wow. kind of started that whole were you, trend. You were in Alaska at that point? Correct. Oh, wow. Okay. How was that living there, growing up there? Great. Uh, the only, you know, they have the same type of restaurants and there's no, there's nothing really unusual. It's just like a regular city. Right. Uh, they're just going to have some, you know, unique uh, weather conditions that <laughs> <laughs> that's aren't a, typical. That's a very polite states. way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. That, other than that, it's pretty much, you know, the, it, it, after a while, it kind of feels like you're living on an island, though. But right, right. other than that, it's, a you know, they, hey, we got Applebee's. We got, you know, whatever you want. It's up there. I'm sure there's a McDonald's there, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So you, you get bit by the bodybuilding bug. When do you actually move out of Alaska and go over to Virginia? At what point? So I ended up in Maryland and that was probably within two years of winning my first show. Okay. And that was only by virtue of my dad being stationed in, uh, gotcha. uh Andrews air force base, okay. which is in Maryland. Sure. So I, I continued to compete while I was there. Um, I would say the largest, uh, bodybuilding win was the, teen mr annapolis that's awesome that's uh, awesome. Yeah. yeah and then from there everything just continued and that eventually culminated in my largest win which was the 1997 uh junior or teen mr america now the year prior i was actually a silver medalist in that same event ah, that's cool that's cool and i came back to win it so yeah that's how and, and that was it you never competed right after that i did i believe two shows so oh, okay. because of that significant win mm -hmm. um i was the united states pick to represent the country for the junior mr world oh cool what organization that, was that in at the time you know i don't know is that like nab uh, or something like that or i actually don't remember oh. the organization now one interesting thing and this was in this took place in antwerp belgium wow. and that was the first bodybuilding competition to be reviewed by the international olympic committee oh wow because there was a potential that it was going to become an olympic sport so it must have been ifbb because i know that ben weeder was really pushing at that time for olympic recognition you know you know i think i would have remembered that and i don't oh that's funny yeah, what, that what been a, pretty how crazy was that going to amsterdam as a team you must have been like holy mackerel i mean i've been to amsterdam it's it's a pretty uh liberal city there yeah, it's um, 
I, I won't say it was totally unusual <laughs> with my uh, military background. Yeah. Uh, you know, just traveling. But yes, just seeing cars drive on the different side of the road or, uh, you know, cobblestone right. roads everywhere yeah. or, you know, different car you know like there's no fords there for example you well, see a lot of Peugeot. you walk and, into and a all- convenience store you could buy ma- mushrooms you know and and, and marijuana a- and stuff absolutely like that. It's crazy chocolates everywhere <laughs> the belgian waffles the belgian waffles they don't eat them with syrup on no. the top like we do they, they're just whipped cream and fruit that's it <laughs> crazy all right so you love bodybuilding obviously you, you did very well as a teenager and why did you decide not to continue going? Because that had to be very hard because I know when, you know, I know a lot of guys who start really young and they just get bit by the bug and that's their whole life becomes, you know, bodybuilding and competing. What made you take a different direction? It really was my whole life. In fact, as a team, I actually had a weightlifting belt with future Mr. Olympia <laughs> inscribed up on it. <laughs> that's great. Um, <laughs> but what happened is when I joined, uh, I turned 18. I actually joined the United States Air Force. Gotcha. And that was a pretty much the main reason I opted not to get on the juice. Gotcha. Essentially, I wasn't sure if the military tested for that type right, of stuff. Right. And I didn't want to risk, you know, my career. So I sure. opted just to stay natural. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, David Henry went through the same thing. We've talked, I've talked to him about that. How many years were you in the military? I ended up doing a total of five and a half active and right. then probably about a year and a half uh, of, a, uh, as a reservist, right. actually. So right. That's cool. Now, when did you say to yourself, hey, you know what? I, I, I do love bodybuilding and I want to somehow make money from the bodybuilding industry. And, and how did you first, what was your first business venture? Well, that's an interesting story. So while I was in the Air Force, the internet, of course, so this is around 96, right. 97, the internet's just taken off. And, you know, I'm in magazines, suddenly I'm getting calls from around the world and people are wondering, hey, Justin, you know, what was your diet like? What was your workout like? Right. And it just got so overwhelming. I'm sure you've been there, Dave. Yeah, I've been, I've been there for 30, <laughs> I've been there for 30 years. <laughs> and, and it got so overwhelming because you're just kind of answering the same questions yeah. over and over. Yeah. And I said, okay, I got to learn about this internet thing. It yeah. just so happened that two people in the squadron that I worked in were instrumental. So one was a Microsoft beta tester, oh, wow. in addition to being an uh, engineer on aircraft. Mm-hmm. And then the other was also a flight engineer. So one was more like an instructor. The other, right. the other was an actual flight engineer, but he was highly knowledgeable of internet technology. So the first guy provided the software that would be instrumental in me starting a business. And then the second guy actually taught me how to basically get an internet presence or a website and actually design the website. Now, when I first started, it was more of a blog than anything. What (laughs) we would call a blog today, even though, as you know, Dave, we didn't have these terms you know, yeah. we didn't call it content creator. No, we didn't no. have those terms like they have now. You couldn't even buy anything on the internet then. It was like a, it was like it was so rudimentary at that time. There was no software. You no. literally had to know HTML. <laughs> yeah. uh, there wasn't too many of us doing this. You know, like right. we can we can pull up the receipts. Like we know who was who was around and who yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. You know, but so you started selling <laughs> equipment right away. That came way oh. late. Okay, so what were you selling initially? <laughs> Initially, I didn't sell anything oh. because when I started, it was essentially just to help people. Yeah, that's how I started. I just, just giving wanted, free information away, right? I yeah. was just giving free information. Now, gotcha. what happened was I had a questions and answer section on my website that was very popular. Mm-hmm. So there were three categories in particular that people were asking in abundance. So bodybuilding supplements, right. abdominal training. Mm-hmm. And then as seen on TV products. Gotcha. So I basically created a website derivative of each of those. So the first was absecrets.com, okay. which was the first ebook on abs ever assembled. Oh, wow. So how did that do? Pre- it did great because you got to understand, I'm in the Air Force and at its peak, I was making about 300 a day. And yeah, it's not a lot to, you know, some of us today, but 
if if you could do that as a side hustle, yeah, that's what gave me the leverage I needed to be able to walk away from the Air Force. That, and actually, that's a lot of money for back then. People don't it really realize. is because this is one hundred percent profit because we're talking about digital information right so that's the key and that still works today yeah well, exactly you're not giving anyone anything you're just giving them your time basically is what it, what you're doing that's it so how much money did you make for like the first year or so a lot so on that book um i never calculated annual revenues but if we were you know i would say an average day was maybe 150 a day what did you charge for the ebook Twenty four ninety five. Occasionally, as low as nineteen ninety five, and as high as twenty nine ninety five. Okay, that that that's and, reasonable price. But you had a lot. You obviously had a lot of people buying it, right? Absolutely, and it eventually came a print version of the book. Oh, now, this cool. was self published, so the concept of publishing back then was kind of like really shadowy, right? Um, unless you had a lot of money, uh, like th- there's plenty of resources now, like Amazon Publishing, right. that make it easy. But they didn't exist back then. Mm-hmm. And so how did people? Self- so you just used your blog to basically advertise your your business. That was it, right? That was it. Yep. Um, you know, it helps if you have some traction. So, in the bodybuilding world, they kind of knew who right. I was. Yeah. And back then, they we had what we call link exchanges, yes. which are still effective yep. today. Yeah. But they're not as popular today as no. they used to be. Everyone put their each other's banners on each other's websites Abs- across the Absolutely. Legit. I remember that. <laughs> I remember I remember using Dreamweaver to, to do HTML code. It was crazy. <laughs> so, you know, at what point did you say, you know what, I could, I could make this even bigger? And I, I'm really interested in the exercise <laughs> equipment company because that, that's, that's a huge endeavor. How did you get involved in that? Well, before that, I have to go back okay. and, and tell you. So don't forget, we talked about there were three main areas of the website right. that people are interested in. So the first was the abs. The second was the infomercial products. Mm-hmm. And what it was was I said, you know, I don't feel comfortable giving my opinion as to the efficacy <laughs> of these products having not tried them myself. I got you. So I said, I'm going to create a website that allowed consumer reviews Ah. of infomercial products and thus fitness infomercial ratings.com was born wow and that's that's like what amazon has basically on all their products right you can just you can everything in fact back then i was in talks with amazon to syndicate my reviews on their website oh my god that would have been you want to talk about one of the originators yes (laughs) you would have made a ton of money if you would have figured that one out yeah absolutely I, i mean we had the team to do apis and connect so there were some talks, but nothing ever came yeah, of it, long yeah. story short. They probably figured it, they might as well do it themselves. That's why they did it. Yeah. See, the problem with it is they were they didn't, like, when it came to infomercial products, of course, they weren't a specialist. Right. Like, I was specializing in it, and almost every product, or at least the popular stuff, mm-hmm. had over 100 reviews. Gotcha. Wow. That's so, a- so we were just saying, look, we have the same uh, filtration standards. Like, we can, you know, screen uh, reviews for fraud and all right. that kind of stuff. And, and you know fakeness or whatever um and we said we'll do x y and z but it, the talks never went anywhere yeah, basically but yeah. they, there was some back and forth initially they you basically gave them the ideas of what to do and they just took it and did it themselves basically <laughs> <what happened. laughs> you already know yeah, right. <laughs> and they just did it better that's all <laughs> now now once that site was in existence and due to its success i said okay well fitness products are working why not just do it for all infomercial products right so i ended up creating infomercial ratings.com and Mm -hmm. that one looked at all infomercial products so if it was the george foreman grill if it was a get rich quick you know uh webs Mm -hmm. uh i'm sorry product um that you know we had reviews of that whatever it is household cooking whatever it was Mm -hmm. it was on that site going all the way back to the inception of the first infomercial product which was what? The Pocket Fisherman was probably <laughs> the first. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that, Friday. That, that must yeah. mean I'm very old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have all this success. I then start the third uh, big category, which was the supplements, the bodybuilding supplements, sure. and thus 
supplementcritic.com was born. It's the exact same site, by the way, as the infomercial review websites. Okay. Only with bodybuilding supplements. Gotcha, gotcha. So we said, okay, we got bodybuilding, uh, bodybuilding.com over here and all these other guys, but nobody's really specializing. That's kind of not getting paid to do X or Y. We're right. just going to focus on bodybuilding reviews, right. uh, bodybuilding supplement reviews. Huge hit. The uh, infomercial sites would ultimately be sold for several hundred thousand. Oh, wow. And then about a year and a half later. Absolutely. And then a year and a half later, I sold uh, the supplement critic is what the uh, name of the site was. Yeah. Uh, I believe it still exists, but it's not, I have no connection to right to, and it doesn't look like I had, uh, like I originally designed it as, but that site ended up selling for almost a half a mil. Wow. So this is in a year and a half. I, I have basically about three quarters of a million. And what I do is I get into the site that I really wanted to do. And that is workouts.com. Right. Okay. Now, if we go back, I was Hold on a on, TV what network called uh, Tech TV back in the day. Okay. So this was, it eventually became G4 uh, TV, but uh, before that it was even uh, ZD TV. Mm-hmm. But I, when I interviewed on that network, I actually told them, I believe the internet was going to get faster to the point where streaming would be better. Right. So I predicted all this and of course it happened. Yeah. Now, absolutely. With workouts, the, the, basis behind it was free exercise video demonstrations online gotcha and then we would sell the equipment featured in the video ah pull some of those up if you can pull those videos up to tell so previously um the internet wasn't fast enough so what you had is a lot of these animated gifts so like people just kind of <laughs> <laughs> doing the you know yeah it would take 20 minutes after. to load a video otherwise right exactly. yeah yeah so around 2007 is when i started this okay um we actually built our own media player now we were watching youtube because yeah. google had just acquired uh youtube yeah now the funny thing is you go okay well why did you why did you design your own player instead of just embedding them in youtube it's because the youtube player wasn't powerful enough we did the same thing. RX Muscle started on our own player. And then I didn't want to give YouTube the hits on it. I wanted people to come to our <laughs> website. And then, yeah. of course, YouTube started monetizing, giving you monetization of the videos, and we switched exactly. over. But... We couldn't predict that at the no, time. No, no, no one knew that. Yeah, You know, it was like, okay, is, is it, you know, what are they doing? Are they going to do this? Are they gonna... We didn't know what they were going to yeah, do. I so... hosted all my own videos originally, yeah. Now, we did put our um database our entire exercise database on youtube if you go look at the workouts youtube channel right it literally was founded in 2007 <laughs> so it's literally one of the oldest yeah. youtube channels around that's but funny we never did anything with it. we just uploaded the videos right. like there's no audio nothing okay uh but yeah man so we built our own player mainly because the youtube player it, I believe it went, uh, it did a minute and 30 second long videos. Right. We right. were able to actually extend that to like five minutes. Yeah, we were doing 20 minute videos actually, but we were after you. We were, we were in 09. We really started that. But um, let me ask you this question. So yes, you sir. have this, this site, you, you can watch people work out and then you can buy the machines. Where were you getting the machine? Who was sourcing the machines for you? Were you like partnered with anyone or did you basically make many different brands available? So... All you do is just find a local supplier. That's usually what the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Um, now, what you trade is for convenience and you know accessibility is you trade profit. Meaning, it's actually better if you have the financial resources to go overseas and import your own brand of products. Yeah. But if you're not there yet, you have to just you know maybe take less of a profit by buying sure. local right uh so you know i just at the time it wasn't a massive operation so i focused on mainly resistance bands so i focused on things that were cheap for me to buy and also cheap for the consumer to buy gotcha after seeing the video so i focused on things like you know the pull-up bands that right. you know have multiple uses the continuous loop uh, I focused on resistance bands with handles. I focused on gym balls. Everything was cheap, jump ropes, things like right. that. And then 
once we had success there, we started getting into, you know, heavier, like weight training equipment right. and ultimately, you know, bumper plates and things like that, that everyone's using now. Did you have a, a warehouse where you stock this stuff or did you have someone else fulfill it for you? Okay. So initially, and I have video of all this, I got to, I got to resurrect it one of these yeah. days, but I, I started in my condo in Scottsdale, Arizona <laughs> at the time. Then I graduated to an eight by 10 storage shed. Yeah. Then a 20 by 20 storage shed. Yeah. And then a 1500 square foot warehouse <laughs> to great. a 4,000 square foot warehouse. Then an 8,000. I bought, the, or I, got, I rented the space next to the 4,000. Right. So I had 8,000 square yeah. feet and ultimately 12,000 square feet. Wow. Now I outright own my own warehouse. That is awesome. That's a great story. I did pretty much similar. I started my house, then I went to the storage thing, and then I, I got the warehouse. But I, I got to the 4,000 square foot warehouse, and I said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I'll just get a fulfillment <laughs> warehouse and, and let them yeah. fulfill it for me. Because then, yeah, you know, 3PL. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Third-party logistics. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, having looked back at this, obviously you own the warehouse, so you, 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 know, you do everything. Would you, would you do anything different you know, if you had to do it again today? You know, there's too many things where I would do different, but it's kind of like when you're when you're in the moment, you're just kind of navigating this because I'm what you call a true essence entrepreneur, <laughs> meaning I didn't you know, I didn't go the venture capital route. Right. You know, I didn't have a rich dad. That's most of us. Yeah. You know, so we're kind of just trudging along. And what I will say, I didn't make too many mistakes, but. I would say maybe one of the big ones uh, or one that I made a lot of money on, but I'd probably go about it differently is overpaying for say like Google ads or something like that. Gotcha. We're spending about 70 grand uh, a year. Wow. Uh, 70,000 annually just on Google. So then there's other Facebook and all these other ones. The problem is that creates a dependency and over dependency on advertising when it's better just to have a salesperson gotcha. because in the event that there's too many changes or new competition, your ads may not continue performing the way they once did. Mm -hmm. So the, the efficiency of your ads or the amount that you're spending relative to the, um, uh, or the frequency of sales. So we call that just a conversion rate Yeah, is it starts to get worse sometimes if there's more competition or their Google's changing things around. Right. Now, what a salesperson does is they can actually offset all those misfortunes or the misspending on ads. So mm -hmm. that would have helped me a lot, you know, but I, for some reason, I just never found the time to bring on an actual dedicated salesperson. Right. Now, and we you, always did good. I mean, I literally have, if you can name the company, uh, there's probably a good chance that I've sold to them. So the Amazons, the right. Cirque du Soleil's, the Google, like the weirdest companies <laughs> you don't think would buy yeah. stuff from me, they bought from me. And it's because things like traffic cones, you see, they're not just for sport. They're using them for parking. They're right. using them for proving grounds. They're using them for warehouse, you know, uh, logistics and things like that. So there's a lot of reasons. Uh, if it's a, a large uh, company, say like Wells Fargo, well, a lot of their corporate headquarters have on-site wellness facilities. Right. Well, somebody's got to outfit those gyms. Gotcha. Gotcha. You, you're the guy. I'm the guy. Now, if someone today, you know, about, let's say a bodybuilder wants to start a business, okay? In today's marketplace, we, we talked about what happened in the past. It's all different today. What would you advise someone to do? How would they get started? You know, what, what, give me an idea of how I could tell a bodybuilder that's out there that's pretty popular, but says, you know what, maybe I only have another three, four years to compete. I want to start making money. I want to use my bodybuilding to earn myself a living for the rest of my life. What, what suggestions can you give people? So the first thing to do is start creating content on a regular uh, basis. So weekly, daily, bi-weekly, whatever you want to do, yeah. you want to just start creating both written and video content. Right. So I would maybe set up a YouTube channel, right. um, Instagram, whatever. Right. Let's say they have a good uh, the following. Let's say they got a good Instagram. They got a good YouTube. What do they do with that now? 
So now you have to figure out something to sell. So usually either information or some kind of coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause if we're talking online, there's not a whole lot you can do, but those are right. still profitable. Like those have never gone away. People are always going to buy books. People are always going to buy, you know, one on ones and things like yeah, that information. So the cool thing about it is like, like courses and, and books, those sell, but you can also do one-on-one -on -one coaching or even group coaching right. to make even more money. So you got your books, you got your, you know, your supplements, whatever you're trying to do. And then you can get even more money out of those groups by offering like one-on-one -on -one or group coaching where the fees are actually higher mm -hmm. and it's less time spent with those uh, group or paying members. Right. And you actually, so it becomes more profitable doing that. Gotcha. Gotcha. So like, what but if, that's, yeah, good. Yeah. That's really the, the thing. See, that's the cheapest way to make money. Now you can go into like products and like, that's a whole nother conversation almost, right. but, um, because that's going to cost you more money, but the easy way to make a lot of money right now is yeah. with content and then doing some kind of written or video training course right or coaching that's hands down you're going to make the most money in fact just with coaching alone like like group coaching um that can probably topple like any of those other if you can really get that streamline because when we're you talking, say when you say group coaching you mean like getting like five people at a time and, and showing them how to work out like yes or do, going over their nutrition and okay. you know like like you literally give them an hour of your time yeah. on a sp on a set schedule. I don't know. Once what do you a week charge or... for something like that? You think? So this we're talking thirty six hundred per person. Thirty six hundred dollars. Yes. And for how many sessions do you get for that cost? So that uh, something like that I would do in in the bodybuilding world no more than three months. Okay, that's a lot and, of money. And what you're and what you're doing is you're teaching them how to transform whatever they're trying to do that 3,600 is, it sounds like a lot, but it's actually not like how much, do, like they're coming to you because they want to either look like you or they, uh, they, they, you, you're solving their problems. Right. I'm charging too you're, little. I think I, I got to get you as my man, my business manager. <laughs> I can help you at any time, my friend. <laughs> All right. But yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and what it is, is the, the 3,600 for one, you have to look at it as almost like a, annual investment yeah or, or that's what you're t teaching them like is that a, is that a lot to get the body you want for a year you, you know over the course of a year two years right it's not a lot yeah no i i don't think it is either but you know but you're just getting cheap. that money up front you might get it in two payments you know yeah. there's different ways you can set it up but it's actually not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things right. and that's really you, if you if you can do the whole transformation thing so you're saying I can take you from point A to point B. Yeah, it's going to cost you something, but it's relative to what you're going after, that body that you want. Right. It's actually not a lot. Right. I'm going to give you a, a scenario. Like I have a, my friend, Mr. G, who has his, a protein cookie that he makes and makes some protein bagels. Yeah. And, he, and he, you know, he's, been, yeah, he's always on our After Hours show, and we, we promote. He's got a great product. It tastes delicious. Um, I eat them, you know, a lot of people buy them, but how, what, how would you advise someone who has a product that's good, they make it themselves, and they want to get it and, and make it into a very big brand? What, what, what steps do you think that they need to take that's important that you've learned along the way that maybe a lot of people don't know about, and that's why they're, they're not succeeding in, in, in the level of success that at least that they want to achieve? Wow, that's a good question. And there's a lot of ways to unpack it. But when you say big brand, you know, does he want to get it in stores? Is he just trying to ultimately, but he would like to make money from it. So I think selling direct to the consumer seems like the probably the, the, the logical place to start, which is what he's doing. And how do you how do you make that big? What's the most important places to market? And what what, you know, pitfalls should he avoid? He's the, the easiest thing is to find a consistent distribution channel mm -hmm. and also look into pairing up uh, his product with other services. So 
if somebody's, uh, you know, doing some kind of uh, online training course, you can actually incorporate these cookies right. into the, the, the program. Gotcha. And then you can do uh, a profit split or a commission mm. based on each course sold or whatever. Right. Uh, or each cookie sold or, or whatever. So you, there's different ways you can skin this cat, to be honest. <laughs> but um, if he's trying to get into stores, that's a whole nother lane. Yeah. But it's just to just keep pushing it. If you can get a big celebrity or something like that, right. any that's kind of jumping the, uh, to the front of the line, but sometimes right. that helps. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Cause sure. it's almost like what happened to me with the infomercial sites and the other sites that I, uh, created that had a huge amount of success. What actually made them particularly successful is getting national media attention. And that's almost like having compounding interest, right? Because, right. you know, it's like, imagine like the New York times or, you know, the wall street journal, sure. <laughs> if you can get on one of those, it just, it, so that worked wonders for a lot of my brands. Gotcha. It's just having that media. Right. Exposure. Right. What just last thing I want to ask you, uh, Justin, amazon.com. We know it's a big, big, you know, it's like a, this behemoth that everyone wants to be a part of because they see, you know, the, the sales and the money, but Amazon has a lot of rules. I mean, we, I, I sell to Amazon and, and it's, you know, there's a lot of little you know, places you can lose a lot of money on if you're not careful. What what would be your best advice to people about getting involved with Amazon and and should people sell their products on Amazon? Wow. <laughs> that's a, that's a really tough one because yeah. I have a lot of experience on Amazon. Yeah. And they can be brutal. Um in my category they charge 15%. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of products, you know, that's a huge uh chunk of your profit sure. going out the door. You definitely want to be careful and, and know there's a lot of rules. Like they don't want you to put uh, like inserts and things. Uh, they yeah. don't want you to do anything that circumvents the sale. Yep. So like once you become a buyer, I can't say, Hey, uh, you know, get a 10% off <laughs> on your next order by going to, you know, species. Right. Right. You can't do that. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, now there's some ways around that. We talk about that later, uh, Dave. But <laughs> you do have to, um, you do have to utilize them, or or, it, it, or they should be considered for utilization because of the amount of traffic, volume. Yeah, and 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 people's mindset. Meaning, there's really not a person on the planet who hasn't bought from Amazon in the last say month. And I'm one, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> yeah, I've never, I've never actually purchased a product. Really? On wow. I'm on there all never, the time. Never, man. never. But um, you, you have to get into the mind of the consumer, and if they're looking in one spot for everything, you have to be where they're shopping. Right. So you, you do have to kind of deal with Amazon, and just you, you just have to navigate their platform accordingly now another thing um i want to say is with all their rules there's still ways around their system to make it profitable so one example i'm going to give you is there was a brand that we were highly profitable on but that uh supplier actually did an exclusivity deal with Amazon, meaning oh, I was not allowed to sell that product. Right. So what I did was I kept selling the product, but I rebranded it as a whole nother product. And it, <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you just uh, say, if we're talking orange cones yeah. and they can't, and I can't sell the, uh, Palumbo sports brand. Yeah. Well, I just, I still use the same orange cone, but I just sell it as the Justin Leonard brand. I got you. I got you. Okay. So you got to be Yeah. So there's crafty. ways to, yeah. yeah, you can keep that profit going. It's just going to take some hacking, yeah. but you do have to deal with Amazon because everybody's there, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, very good advice, Justin. Uh, you know, I'm really impressed with what you've achieved since, you know, your teen years as a bodybuilder. I mean, you really, thank you. You could see this. I like the history of it because I, I, could, I remember when the internet first started back in the 90s and dealing with all the, I mean, it was terrible. I mean, you had to do, like you said, coding and <laughs> it wasn't credit card processing. The videos took forever load. And 
a lot right. of young guys today don't even realize that, but it, it was a real pain in the neck. And you navigated through all of that and you're still relevant today. And so you're really a, a role model in a sense for other bodybuilders out there to say, hey, look, yes, I put a lot of effort. I put a lot of time. I dedicated my life to bodybuilding. But if I put that same effort and that same work mentality that you use for bodybuilding into my business, I can make a living from this for the rest of my life. So Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you for joining us. And uh, you'll have to give us, we'll have to get you back on so you can tell us some of the hacks to get around some of the. Uh, uh, Anytime. The I could Amazon. do a whole one hour lecture <laughs> on everything you need to do to make money on Amazon. All right. You're, the website is workouts with a Z.com. We put that up. And Justin, you also started your own business school, the Leonard School of Business Innovations. And that's, uh, that website is, is live now. So you can check it out. I actually read an Amazon article you put on there, which I thought was really good. Um, I really, yeah, some yeah. good advice on, you know, on that. So yeah, I, at Leonard innovation yep. everywhere to find me. Yep. I, I highly encourage you guys to go on there. He's got a lot of free articles you can read, uh, that will give you some good business ideas. And once again, it's all about making money, doing what you love. And if you don't, if you do that, you'll never work a day in your life. As I always say, thank you, Justin, for joining us. Dave, pleasure to be with you today, sir. All right. And guys, that's going to take us to the end of another episode of RX muscle spotlight. I'm Dave Palumbo with Justin Leonard. We'll see you next time.